Okay. All right, so let's go ahead and uh, start with uh, uh, body electrolytes. We did uh, cover uh, the fluids last uh, class. So uh, today we'll cover the electrolytes. On uh, Wednesday, I will cover acid base. I already posted uh, a focus point. It's a long focus point, but it's, it covers everything, including some uh, problems for you to solve when it comes to acid base. Uh, try and work on them, start working on them. I will uh, finish on Wednesday. I will have a special tutoring session for this on Thursday myself. We, we can do some problems, probably acid-based problems together. And this test will be on Friday and Saturday. So uh, we said the, pharm uh, the pharmacology will be on Wednesday and Thursday, correct? That's what we said. And then, you know, so you'll be so today we'll finish pharmacology and then uh, give you a date to study more if you want. Yeah. Or w w would you like it on uh, tomorrow, starting tomorrow, pharmacology? I thought it was tomorrow. Tomorrow? Okay. So we'll yeah. start. I mean, it's, it's simple. It's another one chapter, I think. So I'll open up tomorrow. If you don't want tomorrow, then Wednesday. If you want to study tomorrow. and then So we'll do tomorrow and Wednesday for pharmacology. And then uh, we'll do uh, Friday. And... Um, and uh, uh, sanity for uh, for uh, pacifists for this one. All right, so uh, electrolyte body electrolytes, uh, as we know, these are uh, mainly uh, uh, different types of ions. We call those ions. Okay, an ion is a charge that you find on some of these uh, uh, elements in general. So we have different elements. We have compounds also. Uh, that has charges on them, so either either a negative charge or a positive charge, and these ions, what they do, they they do so many different good functions in our body. Uh, they have multiple different functions. It depends on uh, the type of uh, electrolyte, and we will cover each one at a time and see how important and what role does it play, and uh, with its uh, normality, and then if it if any of them uh, goes. Uh, abnormal, uh, what would happen to your body? So they balance basically your actions and functions in the body, cellular functions. So without them, you can't function at all. And we know that we get most of these electrolytes mainly through uh, nutrition. So when you eat right, you get most of these electrolytes in. If you don't, then you, you, know, you have an issue. Now, some of these electrolytes are made within our body. So uh, they don't, you know, we don't eat them as is. You can, but mainly they put themselves together uh, to form, uh, uh, the, you know, like for example, bicarbonate, this one here, HCO3. Uh, it comes together with the hydrogen and CO2 together. You know, it comes together to form a bicarbonate. But you can get bicarbonates. I mean, you can take them from uh, the antacids that we discussed, the bicarbonate and acid. You can get that from it. Uh, but uh, so you can get them from food or you can make them within your body <clears throat> to put them together. So we have what we call anions, negative charges, and cations, uh, positive charges. You have them all over the place. You have intracellular and you have the extracellular within the plasma or in the, in the interstitial uh, fluid also. You know, you, you can find, of course, you, you have them moving from inside the cell to the outside to the cell to, you know, to the interstitial uh, space and then to the plasma, the blood moving in and out from these three compartments, basically. Uh, let's take a couple of minutes to watch a little video and then we'll get back to this. So. At Purdue University Northwest, we know that your future as a nurse depends on your credentials. Ah, uh, the famous electrolyte. Sports drink commercials love talking about them, but what are they? I'm not seeing the video, Dr. J. Oh, you're not? Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you are. Hmm. I don't know if anyone else is. I'm okay, not. Okay, that's fine. Let me share again. Let me share. You see it now? Yeah. Yeah. Famous electrolyte. Sports drink commercials love talking about them, but what are they? Why do we need them? And what happens if we don't have enough of them? 
Electrolytes are salts. Actually, they're salts that we take into our body, usually by way of food. Electrolytes dissolve into positive and negative charges and conduct electricity in water. The most common one is sodium chloride or you know, table salt. These are the other common electrolytes found in your body, also known as ions. These charges are crucial because they control the flow of water in our cells and nerve impulses in our body. Ion channels and cell membranes regulate the flow of the positive and negative charges through cells. Water follows these charges and always goes to the side that has the greater number of electrolytes. Thanks, osmosis. Without the balancing act between electrolytes and water, our cells would shrivel up and die or burst from being too full. In nerve cells, a positive ion moving through an ion channel sparks off an electrical impulse, signaling our bodies to function properly. That's right. Electrolytes control the constant impulses of our body to keep our hearts beating, our lungs breathing, and our brains learning. So yeah, electrolytes are pretty important. They also make your sweat salty. When working out, our bodies start to heat up. Ion channels in our cells dump electrolytes or salts into the sweat gland. Thanks to osmosis, water follows closely behind. This increases the pressure in the gland so that salty mix gets pushed out onto your skin. When that water evaporates, it pulls the heat off your body and cools you down, leaving a salty residue behind. But if you lose too many electrolytes, your nerves won't work properly, which can lead to problems with your heart, blood pressure, breathing, and you'll definitely not be performing your best. So you better reach for that bright orange sports drink and get those electrolytes back ASAP, right? Well, maybe not. There's been controversy on whether sports drinks are even necessary. People generally get enough electrolytes to replenish the ones clots in a workout from their diet. Also, some sports drinks have sugar in them. So if you're doing a half an hour of cardio, a single bottle of the stuff will give you back all the calories you just worked off. If you're working out for an hour or so, water will keep you hydrated and you probably don't need those extra electrolytes or sugars. But if you're someone like this, or this, or maybe running a marathon, feel free to reach for that sports drink now and again. Your body will thank you. Thirsty for more? Let us know your burning chemistry questions and we might tackle them in a future video. Thumbs up on the way out and hey. All right, so let's go back to... Uh... So, um... When when we when when she mentioned salt, uh, it, not necessarily sodium chloride. You know, a, the definition of a salt is when you have a negative or a positive charge, or a most likely negative charge, on a compound, okay, or uh, an element, okay. So uh, it is the salt uh, form of that compound, for example. So this is the salt form of bicarbonate when you have the negative charge in there. And usually if you have a missing electron or something, it becomes a salt also. So, uh, so that's what, uh, you know, it's meant by salt. So this is, these are the ones that are most important. These are the ones that you need to keep in mind. And we're going to look at, uh, you know, all of them in, uh, directly or indirectly to make sure that we understand where, where they, what kind of role do they play. So we're going to talk about... Um, the uh, extracellular, which are these, and the intracellular, which are these. Now, when we say intracellular, that means they mainly live inside the cell. Uh, the not, their amount is more than the outside. That's, that's why we call them intracellular. It doesn't mean that you only find them here. You find them also here. But uh, for, for example, potassium is more intracellular than extracellular. So uh, you're gonna think that potassium mainly intracellular. Sodium is extracellular. Uh, that means you have, you find a lot more sodium outside in the interstitial and in a plasma than inside the cell. You know uh, the other uh, PO4 phosphate. Okay, phosphate uh, is the one that uh, is intracellular. You know, and uh, uh, phosphate mainly has a lot to do with energy. So you need that inside because you build ATPs within the mitochondria of the cell. And that's where you use phosphate. So mainly we need the phosphate inside our cell. Uh, proteins, we have them outside and we have them inside. And proteins plays a role as a transporter, okay, uh, of many electrolytes and uh, different hormones and all that. So these are uh, also considered to be electrolytes, uh, but they're, it's a macromolecule. You know, it's, uh, one of the, and it's a nutrition that we have, nutrition molecule. So because it does, uh, if you remember when we talked about anchotic pressure, uh, we said the proteins are the ones that pull water toward them. 
So this protein, if you have those type of proteins inside, they will pull uh, the water toward them. So you find them almost balanced between inside and outside, a little bit more probably inside. Uh, uh, bicarbonate, you have it more outside than inside. Chloride, you have it more outside, extracellular chloride than inside. So chloride has a lot to do with water movement along with sodium. These two guys go together all the time. Sodium chloride, they go together. So you, all, you need to uh, like uh, memorize this picture a little bit if you can, especially, especially with the big ones here. Uh, this will make it easy for you if you know if it's intracellular or extracellular, and that would become easier for you to see the movement of, of sodium, whether it's coming from outside to the inside uh, or potassium coming from inside to the outside, okay? Uh, so, uh, so we will cover today, uh, we'll cover all the, we'll, cover, we'll talk about potassium, we'll talk about sodium, calcium, magnesium, phosphate, and chloride. These are <clears throat> the main four. And when we get to acid base, we'll discuss bicarbonate in general. So um, these are some of the uh, roles of these electrolytes in general, what they do, and these are some of the most important functions. Uh, for example, calcium, we know that calcium, we need it for muscle contraction. If you remember the sarcomere and the calcium going through the sarcomere uh, tubules in order to contract the muscle. So this is important for contraction. Uh, also, it's important for the nerves, you know, signaling the nerves. Again, we have uh, a neural lemma uh, around the uh, nerve that uh, requires calcium to be in there. We know calcium is good, important for blood clotting. Uh, for cell division, when it comes to uh, mitosis, uh, also uh, bones, we know that it's very, very important for bones and teeth. Now, sodium, uh, it has a lot to do with fluid balance. So uh, fluid going inside the cell, fluid coming out of the cell, uh, so you consider sodium. Uh, then, uh, you know, for muscle contraction, a little bit, not as much as calcium probably and magnesium, you know, and potassium, of course, potassium. But in general, sodium has something to do with muscle contraction uh, and it helps nerve sig signal also. Now, magnesium, again, muscle contraction, you know, so it's a, it's a relaxer. You think of magnesium as a relaxer. You know, when I give you mag magnesium, you relax. Uh, and then, uh, you know, so you, we know that magnesium is used for uh, uh, uterus, you know, to relax the contractions, and uh, we know that it uh, really <coughs> relaxes the <coughs> smooth muscles. So, you know, uh, when you give too much of it, you know, it can, uh, uh, which I will mention again in pharmacology. Thanks, Kylie, for reminding me about the magnesium. It's dose dependent. How much we give you magnesium it plays a, a different role. You know, too much, you know, if you take a lot of magnesium, then it causes relaxation of smooth muscles, so diarrhea will happen, you know, and then a uh, little bit of magnesium will reverse, which you end up having constipation a little bit. So you need to make sure that you take the right amount here. So uh, proper heart rhythm also, it has something to do with the rhythm, uh, nerve functioning, bone building also. So magnesium and calcium, uh, both you find them in as minerals inside your bones. So they are very important, and phosphate also, which is not here. So phosphate also has something to do with the bones. Uh, reducing anxiety, uh, digestion, keep stable uh, protein fluid. So all that has something to do with magnesium. Uh, the uh, potassium, uh, potassium is, um, um, is, is the major one that has a lot to do with with a contraction. It's a contractor, so it's inside the cell. So also it keeps blood pressure level stable by vasodilation, vasoconstriction. It regulates the contraction of the heart. It, we know that it uh, plays a major role in pumping in the, in the cells of the heart. And it helps muscle contraction also, muscle functions. Chloride has something to do with the fluid balance like sodium. So sodium and chloride, they're kind of very similar, you know. So these are some of the major, you know, like the common uh, side effects that you can get uh, for, from an imbalance of electrolytes. Uh, uh, you become anxious, uh, trouble sleeping, change in heart. It depends if it's up or down, by the way. These are gener in general, but it, again, uh, you think about it as if, you, uh, if it's less or more of that electrolyte 
you get different symptoms. Uh, but in general, you may, if, you, if you have an imbalance in electrolytes, many of us will get cramps, many of us will get heart issues, palpitation, anxiety, uh, weakness, fatigue, you know, bone issues, digestive system issues, confusion, dizziness. So this is just in general signals of, uh, of, of imbalance. All right, so these are the the numbers that you need to remember. So uh, you need to memorize these numbers here. Okay, I put them in order for you here uh, of increase in, uh, in amounts. It'll be simpler for you to remember. So uh, for example, and they're all like the same units, you know, think of it as milli equivalent per deciliter. Some, sometimes you find them, uh, you know, like milligrams per uh, ml, which is, uh, you know, a higher, a uh, bigger uh, type of unit. But uh, milli, milli equivalent per deciliter is fine for everything if you want to go with it. Uh, just remember the numbers more often what the unit is. So magnesium, okay, uh, would be the first. Magnesium has the lowest number, so 1.5 to 2.5. So think of magnesium being the first one with the smallest. So 1.5 to 2.5, all right, there's a one, uh, one uh, unit in between them. Now, 2.5, you bring 2.5 down here, and that will be phosphate then. So phosphate is 2.5, you add two here, okay? So the first one you add only one. This one you add two. 2.5 to 4.5 would be the phosphate. Then uh, potassium comes in, 3.5 to five, okay? And uh, this will be uh, potassium, through, so 3.5. The next bigger number would be calcium, which is 8.5 to 10.5. <clears throat> uh, this one, Chloride comes in as bigger now, so it's a 95 to 105. And the biggest unit you're going to think of is 135 to 145 would be your sodium. Okay, so uh, these are general actions in general. You know, we consider magnesium relaxant. We consider phosphate as a contractor, uh, which is opposite of magnesium. Okay, uh, potassium, we think of it as exci an excitation type of uh, uh, electrolyte and it's a contractor usually it's within the cell uh, so uh, also calcium okay uh, again bones coagulation all that chloride has to be do with the acid base but fluid balance uh, like sodium also uh, fluid balance and then the extracellular excitation because you find more uh, sodium outside than inside so so just try and remember these numbers because uh, you know, I will ask you, and you need to remember these for the NCLEX, okay? So remember these numbers here and use them, uh, you know, find a way where you can remember them, uh, you know, so you can uh, use them all the time. All right, so, uh, so uh, you know, MPK, you know, MPK, CCN, you know, uh, CCN, MPK, CCN, think about it this way. All right, so here comes the electrolytes relationship. So this one, I need you to uh, memorize. If not, just look on here and see how they are, like which one goes up, and which one comes down, depending on their intracellular or extracellular. Which one has more, which one has less. So, um, you know, if it's outside and it works with, uh, for example, sodium and chlorine, they work together, they're more outside, so they go in, in the same direction. So sodium and chloride, they go in the same direction because the majority of them sits outside. You know, potassium, for example, <clears throat> and phosphate, they go together because they're more what? Inside. <clears throat> uh, so, you know, I mean, that's, that's how it is. Otherwise, you need to remember these things. So, uh, so sodium and potassium, they have an inverse, you know, because you always have sodium outside you have sodium inside. So, uh, you know, you can, uh, uh, so if, if you increase the sodium, you're gonna decrease the potassium. You know, calcium and, uh, so all these up to here are inverse relationships right there. And then similar relationships would be here. So if you do the similar first before the inverse, you can do that. Uh, you know, potassium and phosphate, they go together. Sodium and calcium, they go together. Uh, calcium and vitamin D, they go together. Magnesium and potassium, they go together. 
uh, magnesium and calcium, they go together. Chloride and hydrogen, they go together. So if, if this guy and this guy goes together, oh, okay, then uh, you need to remember uh, that uh, they, they're always moving in one direction. Okay, so they're going either from outside to, to the south, to inside, or from inside to the outside. So whenever you have a chloride, you have a hydrogen following it. You know, magnesium, if you move a magnesium out or in, you have a calcium usually moving out or in, all right? Uh, so uh, magnesium, potassium, uh, calcium, hydrogen, they, these are the ones that kind of moves in one direction. Now, when we look at the inverse up here, uh, one goes in, one comes out. One goes in, one comes out. All right, Hi potassium and hydrogen, they go opposite each other. So when, when, when we take one potassium out, you have one hydrogen coming in. The bicarbonate and hydrogen, they go opposite. So if we, uh, if we decrease the hydrogen, the bicarbonate will go in, up. So this is important for the acid base. Base when we look at acid base, we're going to discuss this. Magnesium and uh, phosphorus, you know, one goes up, the other comes down. Potassium and chloride, one goes up, one comes down. Now, um, you need to sit down and remember these, okay? Uh, many of them are uh, like, uh, they're, you know, after you know one, you will know uh, what's the opposite, okay? So if you know that these guys, they go in the same direction, and you will know that the opposite of it will go opposite. So sodium, increased sodium, potassium goes to calcium, uh, potassium come down, uh, increased potassium, uh, hydrogen come down, uh, and so on and so on. So sit down and put this together and see if uh, there's one way you can memorize it and uh, play around with it, you know, write it down, and uh, try and memorize this. Maybe you can find a mnemonic if you want to, to remember these things. But after you do some problems here and there, and after you practice, and after you look at the physiology, why these things goes uh, up or down against each other, you'll know it. And it has, it has a lot to do with this, with being inside or coming or outside. That's why one goes up, one comes down. If it's low, it's gonna you know go up when this one comes down. So, so if I if I move this in here into the intracellular, you know I get the potassium to come out. Then this one increases, this one comes out. And there we have pumps. We have what we call pumps. If you remember, we have the ATPase potassium uh, uh, sodium pump. Three sodiums goes in, two potassium comes out. So we know that there's a pump there. We have a chloride hydrogen pump. We have a potassium hydrogen pump also. So the uh, chloride and the hydrogen, they go together. So when I have a chloride going in, the hydrogen goes in automatically also. You know, when you have uh, a potassium, uh, which is in, you know, usually inside, if it comes out, the hydrogen comes in. So this is a, a potassium hydrogen pump, you know. Uh, so you will, you will learn uh, as we go on uh, which one is which, and uh, you just need to repeat it over and over until you pick it up. You know, I put all the options for you here, so you, will, you can always refer to this uh, if you are dealing with intercellular or extracellular. And, uh, you know, when you have, uh, you know, like, potassium issues and, uh, and all that. So let's go ahead and start with potassium and talk about this, and then we'll come back to the, uh, you know. So when we talk potassium, and we said it's a contractor. So potassium, because it sits inside the cell, it is, uh, it's more of uh, a contractor. So it causes contractions of the muscle, of the heart and muscle, smooth muscles. Uh, so when it contracts, you know, these are the normal levels, of course, 3.5 to 5 milli equivalent. Uh, what does it do normally? It works on the action potential. So if you remember, uh, potassium is required and sodium are required to move uh, an impulse across the, the, uh, the, you know, the axon of the neuron. And uh, you need the potassium and sodium to move that impulse across. 
uh, and that's called the action potential. So sodium potassium, we covered that when we talked about the uh, cardiovascular, uh, where we covered sodium potassium as important being for action potential. Uh, so it causes an intracellular excitability and a muscle contraction within the cell. So uh, normal, uh, it, it regulates the pH, and the pH has to do with the acidity and the amount of hydrogen we have inside our inside a fluid, specifically the blood here we're talking about. So we said if you increase potassium, usually you decrease hydrogen, so it goes across from opposite from each other. So here's your potassium going in, for example, then a the hydrogen leaves. Um, you know, this is a sodium potassium pump here when we have sodium, and but it has nothing to do with this. This has to do with sodium and potassium. But this is the hydrogen and the uh, potassium pump, okay? Uh, moving things in and out. Uh, with the potassium and sodium pump, which is right over here, which has something to do with potassium and uh, sodium, one goes up, one comes down. Uh, you need to remember also it has something to do, uh, you know, when you, with insulin, okay? So increasing in insulin eventually decrease glucose. When you decrease glucose, you're going to end up having decreasing uh, potassium, right? So it has something to do with uh, insulin. So I need you to remember this. So let's say that someone is diabetic and they're taking insulin, okay? What do you need to watch for? Hypokalemia. Low potassium, correct. So you need to be careful with these diabetics if they're on insulin. So you keep you keep that uh, uh, potassium uh, in your in your mind because as soon as it goes down, then it causes trouble, which we will talk about in a second here. All right. So this is normal for potassium. So let's look at <clears throat> uh, at hyperkalemia, and then we'll go into hypokalemia. So hyperkalemia means increase in potassium. So we said it's a contractor. When I have increase in potassium, which is over here, then I know I'm gonna decrease the, the, the sodium because one goes in, one comes out from the potassium sodium pump. All right, so I'm gonna decrease sodium. When I decrease sodium, what's gonna happen to the blood pressure? It's gonna go down. How about the water? It's gonna go down also because water follows sodium automatically. So you're gonna decrease blood pressure. Now, uh, when you decrease blood pressure, you decrease water, uh, you're gonna cause some retention in the fluid because you don't want it excreted. So, uh, so who kicks in? Who, who does the retention of, uh, what hormone retain, uh, retain water? In the kidney. Would it be ADH? ADH, antidiuretic hormone, right? So antidiuretic hormone will increase uh, in, its, uh, in its function so you can retain more fluid within the plasma. And in general, you'll cause dehydration because you have loss of water in, inside your uh, blood. All right, now I want you to pay attention to this one because this mechanism is, is important. You know, so what did we say about hydrogen and potassium? We said potassium goes up, hydrogen comes down, right? So here's potassium. Where do we have more potassium? Inside. So if you have more potassium inside than outside, if the potassium uh, uh, goes in, uh, comes out from there. So we have what we call hyperkalemia. Hyperkalemia, that means what? Increase in potassium where? Inside the cell or outside? Most of these functions here, or malfunctions, what are we dealing with, inside the cell or outside the cell? I when I say you have hyperkalemia, am I talking about your blood, low in blood, low, calcium, no, low potassium in the blood, or low potassium inside the cell? In the outside? Outside, outside. Everything we're gonna deal with right now, all the abnormalities, it means what? extracellular, so within, within your blood. So listen, you guys, when you do a blood test on someone, right? That's how we find out if they're hyperkalemic or hypokalemic, or hypomagnesia magnesia or hypomagnesia, hypercalcemia or hypocalcemia. All these things, these terms, they refer to what? To the outside, to the extracellular, whether it's interstitial or vascular. Most of the time we're talking vascular in this case. 
So we're, we're discussing your blood, how much potassium we have in your blood. So when I say hyperkalemia, that means I have what? Too much what? Too much what? You have too much potassium where? Outside the cell. Yes, inside the blood, let's say. Let's, let's keep it within the blood for now. You know, unless if we go in details with the movement of the electrolytes. But for now, we're talking about the plasma, right? We're talking about the plasma. So if I have too much potassium, uh, calcium inside my blood, what's going to happen to the hydrogen? Look at this here. So now I have too much in my, in my what? In my plasma. What's going to happen to the plasma hydrogen? It'll go down. Where does it go to? Inside the cell. So more potassium outside. So look, normally, where do you have the potassium? Inside or outside? Inside. Inside. So you have more potassium inside. More hydrogen outside. If I need to move the potassium from inside the cell to the outside, to make it more outside, the hydrogen is going to move inside. See that? But listen, we have a condition that's called metabolic acidosis, which is outside in the blood also. I'm going to end up having acidosis here, but how can I have acidosis if there's less hydrogen outside? Well, when we have too much hydrogen outside, which is metabolic acidosis, okay, then in compensation, the hydrogen shift to the inside. When it does that, then the potassium comes out. Here's the deal. If, if we have metabolic acidosis, we can have hyperkalemia. All right, this is a little confusing, so I need you to be, pay attention to this. Okay, what is the definition of metabolic acidosis? I haven't talked much about it, but acidosis is when you have low pH. When you have a low pH, you have high amount of hydrogens. Okay? An H represents an acid. The more hydrogens you have, the more acidic you are. Okay? Metabolic means it has something to do with the the kidneys, renal issues. So if I have metabolic acidosis, that means I have too much hydrogen inside my blood due to some disorder within my body. Because we'll discuss respiratory later on. When we talk about respiratory, we're talking about the lungs themselves. All right, so... Um, Anyone understands this at all? A Anyone can help bit. out a little bit? Go ahead. Why don't you try, Chantel? Thank you. I'll, I'll walk you through it, if anything. Okay. What, for metabolic acidosis? And hyperkalemia. Why? Okay, so what is metabolic acidosis again? Um, when you have too much acid mm -hmm. outside, like in the plasma of the body. Correct. Okay. And if you have too much acid... How is it related to the hydrogen? Too much hydrogen or low hydrogen? Um, the hydrogen too. Well, you said hydrogen go back into the cell yeah, and then the much, potassium yes, yes, goes high. out. So how you have too much hydrogen if it's going into the cell and not in the plasma? That's what I'm kind of confused with. Good job. Good job. I'm, I'm glad you picked it up. Because if you picked up that, that means you understand what's going on. So listen. We're not talking about hyperkalemia now. We're talking about metabolic acidosis. If you have metabolic acidosis, what does that mean? Too much acid. Oh, go what? ahead. Too much hydrogen where? In the plasma, right? So what happened when you have too much hydrogen in the plasma, the cell wants to balance itself. So many of these extra hydrogens here, right? So here we have what? Extra what? Increase in... Which is this? Hi hydrogen. Yeah. So you have, when you have metabolic acidosis, you have increase in hydrogen. 
Correct? Where though? Inside what? The plasma, you said. Yeah. So, um, so too much in the plasma. When you have too much in the plasma of this, the cell wants to balance itself. So what happened to the hydrogens? They go inside the cell. Now what happened to the potassium that was inside the cell? It'll go out. See that? So if you have metabolic acidosis, you have too much hydrogen in plasma, okay? After that, it moves where? It moves to the inside. When it moves to the inside, it causes the potassium to move outside, which causes hyperkalemia. All right, what is, so this is normal, usually the potassium wear inside the cell, correct? And a little bit of hydrogen outside. We're good. How about if you have too much hydrogen outside now? Well, the hydrogen will move inside. The cell wants to balance this outside. More, more hydrogen outside, which is called acidosis. Then this hydrogen will go inside and potassium will come out. You're going to have a lot of potassium outside now, which is referred to as hyperkalemia. So what is the cause of hyperkalemia in this case? The movement of what? Uh, potassium and outside the cell into the plasma, right? Yeah, potassium going outside into the cell, into the plasma inside the cell. And what, what, what caused it to move out? Uh, the hydrogen going inside the cell. Which came out of what condition? Metabolic acidosis. Acidosis. Is that understood? So many people that have metabolic acidosis, they end up having what? Hyperkalemia. Is that understood? So this is, a, this is uh, one of the major causes of hyperkalemia if people have metabolic acidosis. You know, uh, many people with renal failure have metabolic acidosis, okay? Uh, because they, they kind of collect a lot of hydrogen within their blood. And all these people that have Acido metabolic acidosis, they end up having hyperkalemia. Okay? Now, what about the opposite? Well, I can have the opposite, and I end up having hypokalemia. So just switch the thing around. If you have alkalosis, alkalosis means less hydrogen, right? If you have less hydrogen outside, then you're going to have less hydrogen, uh, less potassium going out, then you end up having what? hypokalemia, because the potassium is not going to go out because you don't have enough hydrogen there. It's going to stay inside, so the plasma will have hypokalemia. Okay? You guys good? Yes. All right, besides Chantel, anybody else? Yes. Okay, fantastic. Anyone? Okay. So, you know what? I'm going to set up a tutoring session anyways on Thursday. We'll have like a couple hours tutoring session. And I'll take you through this, uh, you know, in, in more details if you need to. So, let's move on a little bit. So, what other causes that can lead to hyperkalemia? Uh, renal failure, like I just mentioned, okay? Uh, decreased renal output. So, um, you know, renal failure, congestive heart failure can lead to uh, too much potassium also, uh, late stages. So remember, late stages, you're going to end up at the beginning, uh, you're going to have uh, uh, low potassium, okay? Uh, because when you are congested, you're not contracting much. So you have low potassium trying to contract the muscle. Uh, but later on, after you lose a lot of the fluid and you go into renal uh, failure, then you're going to end up having uh, uh, less potassium. So, uh, I mean, uh, more potassium when you get into the late stages. So, uh, an another one that increases the amount of potassium in the plasma is potassium sparing diuretics. So, what is this potassium sparing diuretic? That means I'm sparing potassium so I can have too much potassium. So, if you put your patient on potassium sparing diuretic, you need to watch for what? Hyperkalemia in that patient. Okay, ACE inhibitors, you know, also. Because sodium and potassium, they go opposite each other. 
And you know that the uh, renin uh, angiotensin uh, system there, uh, basically what you do is you lessen the amount of sodium there in the blood. It lessens the hydrogen and then uh, potassium uh, goes uh, opposite. So it goes up. So now with ACE inhibitors, you decrease the uh, sodium in the blood. Uh, so you increase the potassium there, you end up having hyperkalemia. Is that understood with this, guys? So this one gives you, um, so what is what happens to the sodium and potassium in this case? Up or down, it's the opposite, right? So when you have, um, when you have low sodium, because of the renin angiotensin inhibitor is there, if I give you an, uh, an ACE inhibitor, it's gonna reduce the amount of sodium and what's going to happen to the amount of uh, potassium? It goes up. Make sense? So now you have what? Hyperkalemia. So people with ACE inhibitors, you need to be careful with them uh, getting hyperkalemia. Also, um, NSAIDs, you know, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory uh, drugs. Addison disease, adrenal insufficiency. You know, it has something to do with the uh, amount of sodium. So you have, again, uh, you know, low amount of sodium. This one and this one are the same here. So all these kind of give you, um, you know, this. This also has something to do with, uh, with, with all this. So this one here also, same thing. Uh, this diuretic also the same thing. Okay, but the diuretics they they have something to do with hydrogen a lot. Uh, but uh, you know also sodium. So when I, you know, if you if you die if you have diuresis, okay. Uh, oh, this is this, this is this is yeah yeah this one potassium sparing diuretic. You increase the potassium and reduce the sodium. So all these give you the same mechanism here. Is that understood? All these give you the same mechanism. So if you have hyperkalemia, what's going to happen to you? You're going to have cardiac problems. You know. Uh, weak pulse, uh, decreased blood pressure, arrhythmias. Um, so uh, again, weak pulse. When you have low blood pressure, you're gonna have weak pulse, okay? That's, that's automatic. So if you have somebody with low blood pressure or congestive heart failure, that means the output is, is low, uh, then the, the pulse is gonna be weak. When you feel it, it's very, very faint almost because you don't have enough blood in there. Uh, severe situation lead to V-fib, okay? Uh, ventricular fibrillation could be one of the major things. So hyperkalemia is a problem, isn't it? So be careful with people that have too much. So what's the, what's the abnormality again? You know, it, if it's gonna be more than uh, five, okay? More than five milli equivalent. So if it's more, it's gonna cause all this here. Peaked uh, T wave. So when you look at the EKG, you look at the T wave, uh, it's going to be peaked, peak, you know, you know it looks like a V shape, upside V shape. Uh, sometimes you have ST elevations there. And the PR interval, you know, which is the uh, PR interval is the uh, distance between the P and the R wave. It becomes elongated because uh, you have a delay in the uh, conduction of the, of the uh, impulse within the heart contracting. All right, uh, muscle, muscular, uh, early you get cramps, okay? Early, early times you get cramps, and later uh, you have uh, uh, muscle weakness. So at the beginning, when you have hyperkalemia, you're gonna end up having cramps, twitching, muscle spasm, and then later on, because all that, you know, why are we getting all this? Because it's, uh, we said increase, it's a contractor, right? So potassium is gonna give you cramps because it contracts the muscle. It, you have twitches, you have muscles, all these are contractions, but you're gonna get tired eventually and then you're gonna have a profound muscle weakness after that because you, you're gonna get tired, okay? Now, uh, neuromuscular, uh, you're gonna have increase in deep tendon reflex, okay? Uh, tendon reflex has a lot to do with uh, uh, the amount of, the strength of the tendon, if it's, uh, uh, and they are the ones that actually, of course, tendons get you to uh, flex the knee and uh, extend the knee and all that. So uh, when you have increased 
deep tendon reflex, that means you have uh, hyperactivity of that, of that uh, tendon. So when we take the hammer, percussion hammer, and we hit your knee, and the knee jerks, uh, that's, that, that means you have uh, a normal uh, uh, flexion of the knee. But if, you, if I hit the, with the hammer, I hit your knee and, you, and, and your leg shoots way up, that is increased tendon reflex. With, with hyperkalemia, uh, yeah, with hyperkalemia, you're gonna end up having hyperactivity of that deep tendon reflex. Uh, later on, you can get paralysis. Okay, that's, that's later after you, you know, you, you, again, you spasm, you twitch and all that, but you can end up having uh, paralysis. That's, that's in very, very late. Okay, that's in, in, you know, problems, if you have problems. Um, you know, so hyperkalemia, uh, again, you contract the smooth muscles and that's gonna increase the um, metabolic uh, uh, peristalsis, I'm sorry. So when you increase the peristalsis, you're gonna end up having diarrhea. Okay, and like we said, uh, diarrhea can lead to met metabolic acidosis, by the way. So when you have diarrhea, you can lose a lot of, uh, uh, you know, uh, electrolytes in general, okay? And uh, when you lose all these electrolytes, you, you're gonna retain a lot of the hydrogens there, and then you're gonna end up having what we call metabolic acidosis. So diarrhea can lead to uh, metabolic acidosis, which we'll call, talk about when we get to uh, acidosis alkalosis. Uh, sometimes you go into seizures, okay? Uh, respiratory, shallow respiration, then failure in long term. So we're talking about really untreated type of uh, uh, hyperkalemia. So if you have pe patients that have hyperkalemia for a long period of time and their level is like eight milliequivalent, nine milliequivalent, 10 milliequivalent, untreated, then they can end up going into a heart failure. So management, usually uh, frusamide, uh, uh, caxalate. So frusamide is a diuretic, and we said, you know, diuretics can uh, basically uh, takes the uh, potassium out and keep the sodium in. So that would, uh, uh, you know, get you to, you treat it with frusamide, uh, caxalate, you know, also diet, uh, can relieve the uh, potassium out of your body. Uh, this is a buffer sodium bicarbonate for acidosis. So if you have an acidosis here, that means you have too much hydrogen. If I give you a bicarbonate, it's gonna balance that out and you're gonna increase the amount of, um, uh, you're gonna decrease the amount of acid there. So this could be another treatment for it, okay? So this is, uh, what we just uh, discovered, you know, uh, discussed here as uh, treatment for hyperkalemia. All right, let's go into hypokalemia, which is a decrease in uh, potassium in this case. So it's a relax. So if you have less potassium than normal in the plasma, okay, in the plasma, so everything is in the plasma here, then eventually your muscles are gonna relax because you need the potassium inside the cell in order for it to work and contract. So less potassium give you increase in sodium. Now before we get there, if you have increase in sodium, what is that gonna cause in the plasma? Too much sodium, retention of sodium. Water. Gives you increased water. Yeah, retain water. So here we go, retention of water, increase blood pressure, and then eventually what? Edema, does that make sense? So this is the opposite of this. This one gives you what? Dehydration, this one gives you what? Retention of fluid, edema. So this is exactly the opposite of this. So we said metabolic acidosis here, this is gonna give you metabolic, if you have metabolic alkalosis, you're gonna have hypokalemia. So here, if you have, if you have, if you have, so let me put, um, if you have, if you have, people think that it's the opposite. If you have, if you have metabolic acidosis, then you're gonna end up having hyperkalemia. If you have, Metabolic alkalosis, where are you gonna have? Hypokalemia, okay? And it's exactly the opposite of the mechanism that I explained that to you. So, um, so hypokalemia, okay, could be caused during early stages of congestive heart failure, and then later on, okay, later on, 
uh, late stages, you're gonna have hyperkalemia, remember this? So here, later stages, we're gonna get hyperkalemia. Early stages, where are we gonna get? Hypokalemia. Okay. I have a question. I have a question really quick. Yes. Um, so hydrogen never moves out of the cell, only into the cell? No, they move. They move in. A, your cell is always balancing things out. That's why we have these pumps. Okay. So what, what, are, the, what are the purpose of these pumps? Because I'm, I'm just a little confused then because okay. when we said we had too much hydrogen outside of the cell, it would move in. Mm -hmm. right and then the yeah. potassium would move out because that's right. just trying to balance itself so how does it try to balance itself when there's not enough when there's too little hydrogen outside the cell well listen uh, this is your body your body always trying to uh, move things around from higher concentration to lower concentration as needed it could be a bad situation right this is in this case it's giving you a bad situation here but it's trying to balance itself out so because you have less hydrogen inside than outside now, in this case, when you have metabolic acidosis, so what's going to happen to the hydrogen? It's going to shift inside to balance things out. With that, when this shifts out, what's going to happen to the potassium? It's going to, it's going to shift out because every time we move a, a hydrogen in, potassium comes out. Every time we move a potassium out, hydrogen goes in. You see how they're opposite of each other? So the cell is acting in, in, uh, to balance its situation. But in this case, metabolic acidosis is bad. Okay. So when you have a bad situation, you're gonna end up having bad results, which is hyperkalemia. So we're, we're just saying here, in situations where you have these disorders, you're gonna have these uh, situations there, hyperkalemia or hypokalemia. So one of the causes of hyperkalemia is metabolic acidosis. One of the causes of hypokalemia is metabolic alkalosis. So in metabolic alkalosis, when the, when the potassium is moving into the cell, the hydrogen is moving out? Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay, thank you. Yes. So when you have metabolic alkalosis, that means you have less hydrogen outside, you see? So to balance the alkalosis, your cell will lose its hydrogen, right, from inside, and it'll move it out to balance the alkalosis in the, in the plasma. So then what's gonna happen? The potassium will go in, because you always have to exchange one for the other. You can't just move hydrogens without moving some other electrolyte out, because that's how the pump works. So what's gonna happen? You're gonna end up having hypokalemia. Okay. You got it? Yeah, I got it, it makes sense now, thanks. Okay. All right, so uh, what else can we can cause hypokalemia, digoxin? Uh, digoxin, they bind to the ATPase pump on the same site as potassium. So digoxin, uh, it, it binds to the ATP pump, which is this one here. When it, it uh, binds to it, it causes the uh, potassium to shift inside the cell more. And when this happens, then you end up having hypokalemia. So digoxin, be careful with people taking congestive heart failure because at the end, uh, they, they end up having hypokalemia you know, when, when they go with digoxin. Now you need the potassium, um, you know, uh, why, why do you need potassium inside? So you can lead to contraction, right? So that's why digoxin does that. It moves the potassium inside so it can help the uh, cardiac cell to contract. So what's happening with the amount of potassium in the plasma now? It goes down and you end up having hypokalemia long-term. So long-term digoxin causes hypokalemia and that's why it's toxic. That's why we don't like digoxin because eventually you're gonna end up having hypokalemia uh, when you, uh, in, in the long run. So uh, drugs that causes increased excretion of potassium. So when you, uh, when you excrete too much of it, you're gonna end up hypokalemia. Uh, carbonic anhydrase, okay, uh, inhibitors. Carbonic anhydrase inhibitors are uh, used as diuretics, if you remember. So these are the ones that, uh, carbonic anhydrase is the one that breaks down H2CO3 into H, H and then bicarbonate, which is a step that is not here, but eventually you're gonna have increase in hydrogen. 
So when you have increase in hydrogen, uh, well, you know, here. Uh, when you have, uh, if, if we break this, if we inhibit this, we're gonna produce a lot of hydrogen coming out of, the, uh, out of this. When you have this then, so let me take this out of there, the lower, just not to confuse you here. So if you have H2CO3 in the plasma, you're gonna end up having too much hydrogen. Why? Because H2 here, H2 is gonna split. It's gonna split to H hydrogen, uh, let me just put this here, plus, Okay, plus um, HCO3, all right, HCO3. So when I have this breaking down to this, um, if I, uh, then, then you're gonna have eventually a lot of hydrogen. So when I have too much hydrogen here, I'm gonna have lower calcium, uh, potassium, because they go opposite each other here. So you're gonna end up having uh, uh, potassium, uh, Hypokalemia. Hypokalemia in this case. Okay. Diuretic, they increase the excretion of potassium. Okay. So furosemide, uh, always you, you secrete, secretion it means excretion in this case, because you secrete it into the tubule. So when you secrete it, you lose it. So people that are taking diuretics, you need to make sure that, you know, they're not, uh, so carbon anhydrase inhibitors and different diuretics, all these can lead to hypokalemia. Hyperaldosteronism. Hyperaldosteronism has to do with increase in sodium. So that gives you low potassium also. Cushion, increased cortisol, give you hyperglycemia. And if you remember in this here, we said that increase in insulin gives you decreased glucose, dec uh, then it decreases potassium. So it's the same thing here, all right? So this is the same mechanism. Eventually, we're gonna have hypokalemia in this case. So Cushing eventually give you uh, hyperglycemia, which increases the amount of insulin. When this in insulin increases, then transport of potassium outside that leads to hypokalemia. So here are some of the clinical manifestations. We have arrhythmias, okay, when you have hypokalemia, you're trying to fix things up so people will get arrhythmias. Bradycardia, you slow down, trying to uh, not to have a lot of contractions taking place there. Uh, palpitation always as a side effect of when the heart doesn't go right. You know, if you have some kind of arrhythmia or you know that you're missing some kind of electrolyte, you go into palpitation. Uh, hypotension, you know, so you, uh, uh, lightheadedness. So again, uh, you know, uh, low uh, low potassium can lead to that. Uh, now with EKG hyper, with the hyper we get a peak T wave. Here we have a flat T wave. Here we have ST elevation. Here we have ST depression. Uh, here we have a prominent U wave. You guys, you know, so a prominent U wave that means it's a very high type of U wave. Uh, we'll go down. Actually, I'm sorry. So you have a U wave kind of, uh, it's, it's very prominent. Usually you don't see it much, but now you're gonna see it very well, the U wave that you have on EKG. Neuromuscular, uh, decreased deep tendon. Here we have increased the deep tendon reflex with hypo, you have a redu reduction in the deep tendon reflex. So you have hypo reflexia, okay? So when I tap with the hammer, your knee doesn't jerk much. That's hypokalemia, okay? Uh, muscle weakness, flaccid paralysis also. Now, this paralysis here happens later because you get muscle weakness after you get tired from being spastic so much. Here, you start with that. So muscle weakness, flaccid paralysis, uh, lower limbs, and paresthesia. The GI, the opposite is. So you're going to have lower motility, okay, decreased motility because you need potassium to contract. Here, I'm not contracting much. I'm gonna end up having paralytic ileus. We said the paralytic ileus is paralysis of the ileum from moving. Uh, vomiting, constipation, and then that leads to eventually. So vomiting lead to uh, metabolic alkalosis. Uh, diarrhea leads to acidosis, if you remember from here, we mentioned it. So diarrhea gives you acidosis, which is here. 
I want you to remember this, you know, uh, for next the next class also, because diarrhea relate that always to acidosis, not always, but in general, it's related to acidosis. Uh, vomiting, alkalosis, why? Because when you vomit, you vomit the acid inside your stomach. So when you vomit all that acid inside your stomach, you're gonna have less hydrogen and you're gonna end up having alkalosis. So how do we manage? We give you diet full of this uh, potassium and sparing diuretics. Uh, we need to keep the potassium in you. So we give you diuretics uh, that, uh, you know, that's if you have congestive heart failure or something, we give you this type of diuretic, not the other diuretic, because the other diuretics can cause what? Hypokalemia, remember? So all these diuretics up here causes hypokalemia. So we need to be careful when you have uh, congestive heart failure, we're gonna give you what? Potassium sparing di diuretic. All right, so this one is, uh, when we have hypokalemia, I want you to remember things when you manage this, so which is less than 2.5. Uh, you increase the dietary as a nurse. Uh, oral potassium chloride supplements, they, they come now. Um, IV potassium replacement is okay, but you never give it IV push, okay? Now, IV in general, you need 